Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church here in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I am Jim Miller, the senior pastor here at Grace. Welcome to all who are joining us online, and good to see all of you here as we gather to worship this day. Welcome. Uh, Deacon Helen Ballou is uh, with us. She is actually serving this day. She's at, preaching at Damascus United Methodist in Damascus, Maryland, with reception to follow as she's welcomed into her ministry there, as well as continues in ministry here. So please keep Deacon Helen in your prayers. I look forward to leading us in our time of worshiping together. And if you are joining us for the very first time, so glad that you are here and hope it's the first of many Sunday mornings that we spend together. For those who are online, we invite you to visit our church website, and for those here later, if you will, to graceumc.org. It will tell you more about the life and all that's happening in the life of the church. A couple of things that are coming up. Uh, next Sunday morning will be our Christmas in July celebration. That will be uh, J July 24th, so close to the 25th. We're going to gather and just think about the Christmas season, the, the warmth and the joy of the season, not so much the busyness. We're not wanting to bring that back, but rather just the joy of celebration. So that's going to be our theme for next Sunday morning. Also at this service next Sunday, we'll be celebrating our work camp team who will be leaving on their mission trip. So much to give thanks for. So as we gather today, we give thanks that God is always present with us. In the middle of summer, whatever season we are at in life, God is our source and our strength. And so I welcome you. And now let's take time to center ourselves as Betsy shares with us our morning prelude. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. We gather this day from a week filled with needs and demands. We come to find rest and renewal of our spirits. Open your hearts in love to hear the voice of God. 
We want to quietly rest in God's presence, free from the clamor of the world. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray together. O God, God, from the demands and pressures of of this this past past week, week, we come, O Lord, Lord, seeking rest rest and and renewal. renewal. Hear the cries of our hearts, our prayers, our needs. Heal and restore us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we join in singing How Great Thou Art, found on page 77. sings my soul, my Savior God, 
to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. This time I'd like to invite our younger children to join me up front for this morning's children's message and good morning to all who are joining us online. I was wondering if I would get here first. There we are. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. How's everybody this morning? Doing well? Now, today I wanted to talk to you about something very important, okay? Oh, just a second, I got a text here. <laughs> yeah. Our tea time tomorrow at nine, that'll be fine. Okay, very good. All right. Okay, as I was saying, I wanted to really talk to you about something very important today with our story about Martha and Mary. Excuse me, I'm getting a phone call. Okay, just sure. I'd love to extend a warranty on my car. Sure, can I call you back in a little bit? Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. Where were we? <laughs> Oh, Martha and Mary, of course, yes. I wanted to tell you a very important story about Martha. Excuse me a second here. I got a Facebook request here. I got, they want me to like what they sent. That's really rude, isn't it, of me, isn't it? I keep letting myself be distracted. Do you ever notice that? Sometimes people can be talking to one another and they're not really looking at each other, but they're looking at their phone or they're taking texting and not really paying attention to what's being said. They become distracted. Well, the reason I share that is in our story about Martha and Mary, we can see how easy it is to become distracted. Now, they didn't have cell phones in Jesus' time, did they? But even without cell phones, without out all the modern technology we had, we learned that one can still become distracted if we're not intentional about our faith. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to do so. Now, texting can be a very good thing, can't it? We can text our, our loved ones there and tell them what's going on and uh, calling on the phone. Reagan, when you're a little bit older, I'll tell you about the time your mommy called 911 and the police officer came to our house and we had to explain there was no emergency, but he thanked her for knowing how to call 911. So we know phones can be a good thing there. And even as a church, we have a Facebook page where we can be in communication this wonderful way that we're using Facebook to connect with many of you today. These can all be wonderful tools, but if we're not careful, they can be distractions to us. And I believe that's what Jesus was teaching with this story of Martha and Mary that we're about to look at. What Martha was doing was very good, was cooking a meal. We certainly have meals here at church, don't we? And they're an important part of our, our gatherings, breaking bread together. And there was Mary. She was sitting at Jesus' knee, that is, learning from him, te accepting the teachings that he was offering. That's all very important. It's not one or the other. But what is important is that we always keep Jesus first in our lives. So how might we keep from being distracted this week? Not just by cell phones and the technology, but sometimes just the busyness of our lives. We have to be intentional. And Reagan, I have a little book here for you and for, for each of us here. What I find, we didn't have to leave, but here, we have a book here to take with you. What I find is helpful in my journey is I keep a little note card in my pocket just to pray for somebody that they come to mind or an appointment that I have to meet with someone, I find if I write it down, if I'm intentional about it, I am much more likely to be able to fulfill. 
And so it is our faith. When we think about ways that we can be intentional about thinking about Jesus, turning to him, talking with him, praying with him, we too can be intentional. So this week, and for those of you at home, I hope that you will take time to, whether it's to draw a picture or to write a poem or just go to the Bible and maybe write your favorite verse, just some way that we can be intentional about keeping God first in our lives. It is my prayer that nothing will distract you, but rather all these wonderful tools we have in our lives can be used for God's glory. Okay. Thank you all for coming up and blessings upon your day. Amen. So at this time we have our children's church and nursery care, and you'll have a good time. All right, thank you. Please. Thank you. All right, we're off and running. Okay, good. At this time, I'd like to invite all who are able to please stand as Amy shares with us our gospel lesson for today. The gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. This is the word of the Lord for all people. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we are so thankful that you are never distracted, that we always have your undivided, full attention. There isn't a moment that goes by that you are not watching over us. May this give us more hope than conviction in our daily living. Help us, O oh God, not to live a life out of the fear of, oh, God may be watching but rather help us in faith to live boldly, knowing that you are in fact present there to guide us each and every step of the way. Lord, we pray that as we now take time to reflect upon your word, that your same Holy Spirit that prompted us to be here this morning will work through this time that you will be glorified in all that is offered as we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we continue in our July sermon series of music being good for the soul. And this morning, how can music help us to focus or to relax? How can it keep the distractions away that we may be able to focus more intently? We can learn from one another about this, how to focus. It's amazing how music can just take us instantly to a place or to a particular thought. I wanted to demonstrate that was just some of the television has truly mastered this practice here where you just hear a certain theme song and right away you can identify it. So what I want to do for those of you gathering here and for those who are joining us online, you can use the chat feature if you will. And what we're going to do, we're going to play a few no a song of introduction here. And as soon as you've recognized it, please just shout it out. Type it there and we'll see if you are right here. Again, how music can take us to a certain place. Let's go ahead with our first song, please. Okay. All right, I heard it there, Mr. Will. Were they right, Kevin? Mr. Will? You got it. Very good there. All right. Very good. All right, you're off and rolling here. Let's go to the next one, please. Here. Thank you. Oh, we hardly had to play that one. <laughs> One of my favorites, too. We'll down <laughs> Thank you. Golden Girls, you're right. Okay. We're moving on now. We're moving on All right, you had to go back there a ways in. It's only sure. Jefferson's, you've got it there. Very good. Thank you. All right, you. I had to listen to that one for a while before I recognized it. 
You're right. Very good. Dating yourself. Yeah, there you go. You got it. You're right. Very good. You're doing well here. There they are. All right. Very good. Another club. Friends, there we are. You did wonderful there. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So as we gather, how music can just take us to a certain place in time. I believe that's the beauty of the gospel and the Holy Spirit working as we see demonstrated in this story that Amy shared with us about Martha and Mary. Just hearing this account, although how many years ago, just takes you into scene. Maybe it took you into your very own households and um, sisters talking or combating with one another. Or maybe it reminded you of someone in particular here. That's the beauty of the Gospels, that we can see ourselves in them. But when we think of this story, and then if you were here last Sunday, we had the account of the Good Samaritan. They seem to be telling us different things. One is service, and then today Jesus is saying that Mary's chosen the better path of contemplation. Which one is it? Well, we look at it this way, as one of our, uh, uh, Fred Craddock, one of the famous preachers, put it this way. He wrote, if we asked, he says in this, if we ask Jesus which example we are to follow, the act of Good Samaritan or the contemplate of Mary, Jesus would probably say, Yes. It's not a story or an account of either or, in other words. It is both. Whether it is the action of serving, as we saw with the Good Samaritan last Sunday, caring for one in need, or here where we have Martha and, and Mary, it is a story of both. Because even when you are contemplating, even when you are focusing on the study of God's Word. I and mean, here she was before Jesus as a disciple, learning, reading, taking in the Word can call us into action as well. For example, the story is told of Grace Thomas by preacher Thomas Lang. Grace was born in the early 20th century as the second of five children. Her father was a streetcar conductor in Birmingham, Alabama, and so Grace grew up in modest circumstances. Later in life, after getting married and moving to Georgia, Grace took a clerking job in the state capitol in Atlanta, where she developed a fondness for politics and for law. So although already a full-time mother and a full-time clerk, Grace enrolled in night school to study law. In 1954, Grace shocked her family by announcing she wanted to run for public office. What's more, Grace didn't want to run for the drain commissioner or for city council. Grace ran for governor of the state of Georgia. Well, There's a total of nine candidates that year. Nine candidates, one issue. It was 1954, and the issue was Brown versus Board of Education the landmark decision that mandated a desegregating of schools. Grace Thomas was alone among the nine candidates to say she thought this was a just decision. Her campaign slogan was, say Grace at the polls. Well, hardly anyone did though, and Grace ran dead last. Her family was glad she got it out of her system, except she didn't, and so decided to run for governor again in 1962. By then, the racial tensions in the South were far tauter than they had been eight years earlier. Grace's progressive platform on race issues earned her a number of death threats. One day she held a rally in a small Georgia town and chose as her venue the old slave market in town square. As she stood there, Grace motioned to the platform where once human beings had been bought and sold like a product and she said, the old has passed away, the new has come. A new day has come when all Georgians, white and black, can join hands and work together. Well, at that point, a red-faced man in the crowd interrupted Grace's speech to blurt out, Are you a communist? Why, no, Grace replied quietly. Well, then where, where are you getting all them ideas? 
Grace pointed to a steeple of the nearby Baptist church. I learned them over there in Sunday school. Grace had spent time listening to the word of her Lord. What she heard changed her life and launched her on a very specific mission in life. It's always good to take time to listen to the word of the Lord, but that word is dangerous. It always leads to action. She may have finished last, but she was the only one of the nine candidates to stand for what was just. We would be hard pressed to name all the other candidates. And even though she didn't win the election then, it is her actions that came out of the words she studied in Sunday school that were taught to her that have made a difference. This is what Jesus was teaching with Martha and with Mary. And for this to be a gospel account here, where we have both, where we do look back to last week, to the Good Samaritan, and yes, we look to today's lesson. It's not one or the other, but it's both. Both Martha and Mary referred to Jesus as Lord, after all. Mary, by her very actions, kneeling at his feet as a disciple. Martha, by her words, crying out to Jesus, Lord, both recognized him as Lord, but the key of recognizing the next steps that God was calling them to take. It's important that we look at these stories. I mean, they do help us fulfill the Shema that we heard last week, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Clearly, we see that in these accounts. The Good Samaritan last week, Martha preparing the meal, but we also see it in Mary as well. What Jesus offers us in this teaching, notice the characters. Last week, the Good Samaritan, the one who was the outcast, the outsider. Mary, as a woman, kneeling, learning as a disciple. The disciples were men. Here is what Jesus is saying, and I think he says it in such a way, I don't think it's scolding Martha when he says, Martha, Martha, you are distracted by many things. There's only one thing on which you are to ponder. Mary has chosen what is better, what is so important in this moment. What we see here is Jesus is demonstrating what is possible to Martha and to Mary. We must demonstrate that in Christ Jesus, what seemingly is impossible becomes possible. We are not limited by society norms. Martha may have been told that was her role, to be preparing the meal and no more. Jesus is teaching in this moment, there is so much more that is possible for you to experience in him. A couple of weeks ago, Betsy and I had the opportunity when we were in Ohio to visit our, our relatives, and one of the people I visited was my Aunt Janice. I tell her she's my favorite aunt. Well, she's my only aunt, okay. My mother was only child. My dad only had one sister who lived to adulthood, but nevertheless, she is my favorite aunt. She may be watching this broadcast later. Janice is going to be 98 years young uh, later this summer. She demonstrated for me throughout my life what it means to be a faithful disciple. And that's funny, sometimes it's some of the simplest of moments that we hold on to. We were gathering as a church family, it was Advent. We were about to have an Advent dinner at church that night. And so the women were preparing the food in the kitchen. It happened to be one of those rare years that the Cleveland Browns football team was doing well. And they were in the playoffs. And the game was at the same time our dinner was to be held, so we didn't have cell phones then and other technology. So somebody thought to bring a portable television, and they brought it into the church parlor and hooked it up. And so all the young men and men, we were in there watching the game while the meal was being prepared. 
One thing you must know about my Aunt Janice is she loves her sports teams. Her Buckeyes, again this is Ohio, and the Cleveland Browns, and so there we all are watching the game, and the door opens and in comes Janice. Say, I'm going to watch with you. Now again, a simple, a simple illustration, but there she was in that moment. She didn't let societal barriters say, no, this is not your place. You should be over there cooking the meal. No, she was there amongst us. And continued to demonstrate to me throughout my life what it means to follow Christ. When her husband, my uncle, would pass in an early age, she would find the strength to go back to work, to carry on. She would establish a scholarship in his name that would help future ministers, those being called into the faith. And there when we, we met with her uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there she lives at uh, Copeland Oaks, which is like Asbury, a very similar retirement community. She was saying, I'm so thankful. Her Maculant degeneration, she was actually, her sight had improved the treatment that she was under. She was seeing better. She was so grateful. She said, I can, I can be able to navigate, to ride the bus to church again. And then pointing to the hall outside her door, she said, and I sure hope a neighbor moves in that room soon. I look forward to welcoming them into the community. Just in all these wonderful ways, she was demonstrating to me what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to me to live your faith, not just church, but to live it in the community. And I believe that's what Jesus is calling each of us to be able to do. Professor Sharon Ringy put it this way. She wrote, in its own way, the conjunction of the stories about the Good Samaritan and the female disciples voiced Jesus' protest against the rules and boundaries set by the culture in which he lived. As they developed seeing and hearing as metaphors for the activity of the kingdom, the twin stories also exposed the injustice of social barriers that categorize, restrict, and oppress various groups in any society, Samaritans, victims and women. To love God with all one's heart and one's neighbor as oneself meant then and now that one must often reject society's rules in favor of the codes of the kingdom, a society without distinction and boundaries between its members. The rule at societies are just two, to love God and to love one's neighbor. But these rules are so radically different from those of the society in which we live, that living by them invariably calls us to disregard all else, break the rules, and follow Jesus' example. How are you being called to disregard society's rules and expectations and your own obedience to Christ this day? Society would have told Mary then, no, you're not a disciple. Perhaps you're being told that you're not as important. Perhaps you're being told, no, I, I could never do that. You could never do that because of the color of your skin or because of where you are from, because of your economic situation. We can't live by society's rules. We must put Christ's rules first. We must make Christ the priority in our lives. That's what Jesus was saying to Martha. Do not let the world standards distract you from what I am calling you to do and to live, to follow to take his word. And I look forward to the day when we live in a just society, when these issues are, are no more, but the word will still have an instruction for us. Even in the time when we are all on equal footing, God's word is still there to call us. As the church, we gather in what's known as the ordinary time. That's the church calendar by which we live. So the color is green, you'll see that on our altar, impairments, meaning a time of growth. But what I don't want you to hear in ordinary time is, oh, that's ho-hum time. That is, it's not a special season, it's not Advent, or it's, it's not Lent, or there's a, a special occasion there. That's not what it means. Go back to your math class for a moment here. Do you remember such a thing as ordinal numbers and cardinal numbers? Ordinal numbers meant place, like 
the Orioles may no longer be in last place if they keep going the, the way they're going. That, that's ordering. That, that's order versus quantity, cardinal how many. So when we talk about ordering our lives, what Jesus was inviting Martha to do, what Jesus is inviting all of us to do is to properly order our lives. You can have many forms of serving whether it is in a meal or whether it is in a disciple class, when all there are many is forms of worship. But there must be one object of our worship, of our living, and that is found in Jesus Christ. Cardinal, first, first place in our living. That's what Jesus was teaching. The world needs Martha's and Mary's, that's for sure. Max Locato put it this way when he once wrote the following. He, in fact, I agree, he was right on target when he wrote, every church needs a Martha. Change that. Every church needs a hundred Marthas. Sleeves rolled up and ready. They keep the pace for the church. Because of Martha's, the church budgets get balanced. Church buildings get repaired and cleaned. Babies get bounced on loving knees in the nursery. You don't appreciate Martha's until a Martha is missing. And all the Marys of the church start scrambling to find the keys to the locked doors, turn off the lights, and turn off the fans. Yes, the Marthas are the energizer bunnies of the church. They keep going and going and going. Martha was a live wire to be sure. However, even live wires need a time out for recharging. Work without worship will soon burn you out. Even in church we can lose our sense of perspective. This is our call this morning. When Jesus says there is a better way, well we know that he is the way, is the truth, is the life. He is the one who will guide us in our everyday living. But if we become so consumed that good works, good practices in our lives have become distractions and are keeping us from being open to what God is wanting to do in our lives this day, when we worship, when we once again see ordinal numbers, Christ being first in our lives. We seek to live that out in our lives each and every day, and it has a transforming effect upon the life of the church. Carvetta Mitchell described a church in Wisconsin in the following way, and she shared this. There's a chapel somewhere in Wisconsin that has a stained glass window over the entrance, showing the figure of Jesus with open arms. Some, seeing it for the first time, remarked, how meaningful, he seems to be inviting us into worship. That's true, the pastor said, he is indeed inviting us into worship. When the service was over and the same person was going out the door, he looked up at the window again. There was the figure of Jesus with the same invitingly open arms. Look, he said, now he seems to be inviting us out. Right, the pastor replied, the Jesus who invited you to worship now invites you out into the world to serve other people in his name. Our Lord is greatly interested not only in what goes on in the church, but in what goes on in the office, the home, the factory, the soccer field. That's where people spend most of their time. That's where the Christian life is to be lived. It's not something that we leave here. Because when we gather together, when we worship together, when we serve together, such as our work team will be doing next week, when we rebuild together, as we were celebrating Tom Deckard's life this past Friday, we were reminded of his work and of Linda's leadership. And what a difference when we come together, we learn from one another. Even as seasoned Christians, Sometimes we can learn from the babes in the faith, the infants in the faith. One mom shared the account how her child was saying her prayers. And you can recall a time as a parent or grandparent or aunt that you've had such an opportunity. 
She heard her little girl listing the request of blessings that children often offer, praying for mommy and daddy, grandma and grandpa, and on and on. But she was surprised, however, to hear the child conclude her prayer with these words. Now, Jesus, what would you like for me to do for you? The little girl had grasped the relationships of the Christian life, conversation of the heart, our worship with Jesus, issues into the desire to do something for Jesus. That's what we saw taking place in the home of Martha and Mary, that ongoing conversation with Jesus, where, yes, we uplift our concerns, our joys that we carry in our lives, but imagine if each and every one of us would take that time to say, now, Jesus, what is it that I can do for you? So we see this story as not an either-or. In fact, the more I look at this story and think about last week and this week, I think the Good Samaritan and the story of Martha and Mary, these are stories that must be held together. Maybe we've done that over the centuries. The original scriptures were not written down, but were oral. Originally did not have chapter and verse numbers separating them all. Jesus didn't speak in red letters after all, but we, have over time, have added all this. But now these two stories must go together. The serving of the needs around us, and yes, being at the feet of Jesus as a disciple, learning from him, and taking what we learn and applying it to our everyday living. Sometimes we think of the faith and we compare ourselves with others, and that's where we get in trouble. We're comparing Martha and Mary. We're comparing this story with that story and always asking, which is it? God isn't going to ask anything of any of us that God is not willing to provide the strength and the opportunity to fulfill. We are wired for faith not for the fears that threaten to distract us. Those are not my words. This is something E. Stanley Jones shared that I want to use as we close. Jones once wrote, I am inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. These are not my native air. But in faith and confidence, I breathe freely. These are my native air. The John Hopkins University doctor says, we do not know why it is that worriers die sooner than the non-worriers, but that is a fact. But I, who am simple of mind, think I know. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain cell and soul, for faith and not for fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against reality. This day, may we not live letting our worries get the better hand, letting our fear distract us from the life of faith that God invites us to through the Gospels. May the music guide us to a deeper relationship with Christ. And so I give you these challenges as we now go forth. I invite you this week to take time to examine your priorities. Have we let society norms and boundaries keep us from following God's will for our lives or for our church? Secondly, this is a story about pointing out what is possible, what God wants to be possible Pray this week, Lord, what is it that you want to make possible in my life, in this church, in the work of the church as a whole? And lastly, what does it mean to you to live by faith and not by fear? How is this being demonstrated in your life? Each of us have new opportunity to live a life based on faith, thanks to the gift that has been given to us, the music of our soul, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now we're going to have a special music by Polly Conley. Good morning, Polly.
Thank you, Polly, so much. That's it. Thank you. Let us join together as we offer our prayer of confession. Patient Lord, we schedule our lives down to the very second. We crowd in as much activity as we can and then wonder why we are so stressed out and tired. We are afraid to miss out on anything. And when it comes time to be with others, we spend our time worrying about details rather than longing for the visit. Forgive us when we get so caught up in the details and miss the opportunity to sit at your feet, learning, listening, growing in our faith. Help us to place ourselves in your care. Slow us down just a bit so that we can see the wonders you have placed before us and truly enjoy and share the blessings you have given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. On the seventh day of creation, God rested, creating a Sabbath, a time set apart for rest, to learn, to listen, to be quiet and at peace. Let Sabbath take root in your heart and in your life. Be at peace in God's love for you. Amen. Let us continue in an attitude of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath for this opportunity to gather in your name. Whether we are gathering online or in person, whether this is our first Sunday or our years of spending Sunday in this special place, we thank you, O oh God, for the fresh word that we find in you. We thank you for how music has ministered to our souls once again, to have that quiet peace with you, that quiet place. Lord, sanctuary seems so hard to find these days. There's nowhere, thanks to phones and tablets and all the other devices, that we are unplugged from the world, it seems. We pray, O oh God, and we thank you for technology, and for many ways it has saved, it has helped so many. Help us, O oh God, to use these blessings in ways that bring glory to you may they not take away from our relationship with you or one another. For all the forms there are of worship, all the ways we can worship, styles of worship, music, and all that leads, may it all lead to a closer walk with you, to lives that are pleasing to you. The world tells us how to live and seems to want to tell us as the church that we're not important anymore. But there's someone this day, perhaps in this moment, who's hearing the good news for the first time, is hearing the fact that they are loved, that they are not less than, that we are each children of God, cherished, valued by you, and that in you we find the better path to take. So many options our world offers. Lord, we pray that each of us will be open to your calling, to your leading. This day, O oh God, we bring personal concerns. We silently raise them to you, asking, O oh God, for your strength, for your wisdom, for your understanding, for forgiveness, and above all else, restoration. Now, don't take us back. Sometimes we find ourselves talking about before COVID or before this or before that, Lord, we can't reverse time, but rather this day we have opportunity to glorify you, to be the caring church, to be the church that's reaching out, that is serving the meal, but is also growing and understanding your word, is taking the better path of not letting even good works distract us from the plans you have for us. So whatever the rest of this day has in store, oh God, we pray and remind us that you are greater than the one who is in the world, that love is greater than any evil, that love is stronger than any act of hate. And where there is violence, where there is hurt, where there is harm being contemplated or carried out, 
We pray, O oh God, for healing. We pray, O oh God, that we can be like Grace Thomas, that we are not afraid to be that one person that stands up for what is right, that works for justice, that practices justice and seeking well-being for all. On our own, we don't get very far. At times of God, we feel like we take steps backwards. But in you is the freshness of a new day. So we look to you in this time of prayer to be our source of strength as we now offer together the prayer that you have given us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we join in singing our closing hymn, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Please be seated. Again, our thanks to all who have joined us online and have gathered here in person. We look forward to gathering again next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for our Christmas in July. So just come prepared to celebrate the joy of Christmas, the birth of Christ. We cannot, and the good news it means, we cannot limit to one Sunday or season in the life of the church. So we look forward to celebrating together. And at the same service next Sunday, we will be dedicating our work team, our work camp, that will be individuals will be leaving right after service, and they'll be serving this year. They are not going far. They are going to Frederick, Maryland for a week of work camp. But in some ways, I think that's more challenging to, to offer a camp nearby and far away and just give thanks for all of our adults and youth who have stepped forward and who will be part of this journey. We will be keeping you all in our prayers. Again, I remind you to take with you this week the following challenges. Please take time to examine your priorities. Have we let society norms and boundaries keep us from following God's will for our lives, for our church? It's a story about pointing out what is possible, what God wants to be possible, 
So pray this week, Lord, what is it that you want to make possible in my life, in this church, in the work of the church as a whole? And lastly, what does it mean to you to live by faith and not by fear? How is this being demonstrated in your life? Now as we go forth, for just a moment, take a deep breath. That breath is restorative. It is bringing freshness and relaxation to your life. Go from this place in peace, and may God's peace be in your hearts. Amen.